thank you so much for sitting down with me. It's a real honor. You know, I think one thing that's really important to your work is, is, is your work in these remarkable places of political significance over the years, over your um, career. And so I'm wondering, what does this particular site mean for you? What is the connection here? And maybe how does it connect to um, a, a potential political significance of, of this particular work at the cistern? Or it's becoming increasingly political. So in that sense, it's uh, it, the cistern being the very first place where they, they, they kept, they storage the, the drinkable water of Houston. I think upon receiving an invitation to visit the place, I was of course uh, striken by the immensity of it. It's, it's, it's very beautiful, it's both elegant and very bold. It's concrete, but yet it has a certain... The, the dimensions feel right, the scale, so there is a certain elegance to, to that. And, and then when you, when you approach... When you try to find an idea for such a, for such a place of such a scale, it's uh, it's not just about the idea itself, but it's about an idea that can apply to that scale, that can nourish that scale, that can uh, uh, enter in a dialogue with, with, with such a scale. I was interested about the idea of the Houston and the horizon, the idea of exploration, uh, the pioneers, and then the exploration of the riches of the of the of the world, like the drilling for for oil, and then of course. NASA, space exploration. I already had this sort of, uh, of like an after image of something that was to come, meaning the image of this turntable uh, drifting and rotating in zero gravity. Later on, I came across the story of Ron McNair, this uh, a brilliant astronaut, one of the first black astronauts in the history of the United States, a very good saxophone player uh, who intended to make the first recording of a professional playing music in space, uh, something that unfortunately it did not happen as we know that upon that uh, voyage with the, the Challenger the disaster happened. So the, the performance remained an intention, not a recording. When these two elements came in, the idea of a turntable that is rotating in space drifting the, the tone arm and stylus uh, uh, every now and then touching the vinyl. There is this sort of a battle for, for the tone uh, arm uh, to, to perform its task, for the music to continue. I was not interested to play the soundtrack of what um, Ron McNair would have played, which was eventually performed by another saxophone player in the concert that happened uh, shortly after, and also in homage to this such a loss um, uh, called Rendezvous in Houston. So I, I was not interested in making the turntable play that recording because it would be uh, counterintuitive. What is the soundtrack of an intention? I was interested in this idea of the solitude that it might be being out there in space. A wind instrument because it connects to breath and that's probably when we are really alone, that's the last thing keeps us company, so to say. And then little by little, I arrived to this composition of Messiaen, Quatour pour la fin des temps. Quatour for the end of times. I find it's an immediate correspondence between the idea of being so dustily far in the space, the idea of how does time bend in space, what is the end of time? There is only one movement in his uh, quator, which is written for a solo instrument, for a clarinet, and it's the one I, uh, I use, which is the abyss of the, of the birds, uh, which was originally played the very first time in, a, in the Stalag, in the camp where they were captive by Akoka, the, 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 the a co-friend musician, but also co-prisoner with Messiaen at uh, that time. So this brought these two other opposites, but also the same. One uh, feeling captive in space, where your life relies so much on this engineered peace around you, which is, but, and, and yet, as we know, also unfortunately, from the, it's as fragile as it can be. And on the other side, this solitude, the loneliness, the, of captivity being uh, uh, 
a POW, a prisoner of war, mm -hmm. in a in a camp. Uh, and in both cases, the idea of trying to overcome that that sense of uh, solitude or captivity, where you are not, you cannot be uh, on command of your will. I think one thing that really interests me is this question of intuition. So on one hand, you have Ronald McNair, mm -hmm. a black musician who's going to play in space, but of course, um, only produced, as you said, a, a, a soundtrack of, of intention. And on the other hand, you have Messian's quartet for the end of time, um, which was composed in a uh, POW camp. And I wonder what you think about this question of, of intuition. It is such a uh, kind of a masculinist term of, you know, um, a, 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 a guy working away in his studio by himself, suddenly having a, 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 a flashbulb of, of inspirations. So I wonder how you relate to this concept of intuition as mm. you bring uh, disparate uh, histories together. Mm. Well, I think, I mean, Intuition does play uh, uh, an important role in my work because it's uh, most of the time it's work um, uh, that has a, a, a process. The idea will change throughout the process, hopefully even. And the only thing that re should remain stable at best is the intuition about where the process should bring the work. I am really interested in this question of expertise and how it might relate to a project like um, The Cistern where you do have these historically hefty um, moments, neither of which I knew anything about, um, sort of brought together. I think I do rely on expertise and I do rely a lot on the expertise of people I work with. Olivier Guanar, one of my uh, oldest collaborators, sound designer, fantastic sound designer, he has been uh, part of, of this collaboration from the very beginning, from uh, together with Andre Vida, a musician and saxophone player based in Berlin. Uh, and then in the case of Olivier, for example, he takes this project from the beginning when we are mocking up the, the new continu continuity of, of how the vinyl is being played by the, sty by the stylus, not necessarily in the continuity of the music. <laughs> of the recording, the moments of mixing it here in the space, the moment of how our recording uh, will be played out in a space with such a big frequency response. We have two reflections in the system. is the, the reflection of the image on the water and the reflection of uh, the, the frequency response, the way how the, re the space reflects the, the sound. For example, and there, there, there is something different with each of them because the water reflection is just repeating the same image mirroring at, at once. In terms of sound reflection, because I was very concerned with the frequency response of that space, it's like it's huge, you go there and it's like, a, 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 it would be, you'd think it would be suicidal for any sound designer to, to work there. We did a, a, speaking of expertise, we needed to do um, a, a study of the frequency response of the space. There is a protocol about how it's done. It was done by people here, sent to, to someone we work with in, in Paris. He did a, um, the mathematical preparations and we knew exactly what was the reverb of the space. We could even produce it as a plugin, so you could uh, apply it to a, a sound and we could hear the reverb of that sound. Which, and why I'm saying all this is not because of the, the how complicated it sounds, but this became part of the DNA of the composition of the of the rearrangement of the music because um, we knew we'd have a lot of reverb. If you leave the sounds and the reverbs keep on accumulating, at some point sound cannot articulate itself anymore. So we uh, we used all this moment as the stylus is losing uh, the traction, and therefore there is a moment of silence. These moments of silence often are there in the necessary duration to let the energy of the previous sound die out, dissipate. So we use this frequency response of the space itself as a conductor about the silences that we placed in the, in the soundtrack. 
And this is what, uh, so there, uh, the reflection of the sound is not like the reflection in the image that repeats and mirrors the same thing twice. In that case, case it, it entails it, it ensues, it gives it body, makes it more present even after the last note has been played. So this double reflection, I think it was uh, extremely important to what one sees and what one hears and, and also sometimes how you start hearing what you see and vice versa. Mm. You start seeing what you hear. But especially the moment that then the image becomes abstract because of the reflection and it's the, 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 the acoustic reflection that helps you materialize in your mind what it is that is playing. <laughs> something so um, profoundly lush and engaging about um, how your work lives in the space and it's both uh, terrifying and and enjoyable and it, it's a very um, it's a very corporeal experience uh, being in there it's like it's like being in a bathtub mm -hmm. and so I wonder I wonder if there is an inverse relationship between expertise and enjoyment no absolutely in each case, whether in, in, the, in the current project, speaking of Andre Vida, the musician, saxophone player, or uh, Olivier Guanard, the sound designer, they are very expert in what they do, but they are also extremely open-minded. So the expertise is a tool, it's not a prison within which they, they, they are. To me, it's very important, the, the constraints of reality. For example, just to give some examples from previous work, for example, Jamil Mundok in Long Sorrow, the saxophone player who is suspended in the, in the 13th floor of a, of a building, and then he's playing there. The only way for him to forget the condition of being suspended there is just to continuously imagine the moment next the note next, meaning he could not have been a violin player who is, who is playing uh, an existing score. Therefore, how important it was to have somebody who was able to improvise, to, to, to negotiate, uh, to, f to continuously focus on what is next. But in order for that sort of thing to come out, you need to, 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 to produce some form of constraint in the reality, the constraint of being suspended. In this film, there is a big constraint with uh, Messiaen being captive, a huge constraint with Rod McNair. In terms of technology, there was no constraint for me because CGI, it's basically, you have no, no constraint. You can do whatever you want. You do animation. For me, it was very important to insert constraints inside. To me, that was very important not to not to just do anything I wanted, basically do animation, but have inject a certain preconditions of the reality that the, the tone arm is going to fall back after it has completed a certain circle or loop or aid in its sort of dancing in, in the space. And only then I could, the, it could play the music. Producing these limits was very important. First, producing, setting the stage for limits is very important for my work. There's a wonderful quote from Messiaen saying, the abyss is time with its sadness, its weariness. The birds are the opposite to time. They are our desire for light. So that's the um, section of quartet for the end of time with the, with the clarinet. Um, but I think it, it, it's interesting to think about how at various points in your work you've pointed to disparities in how bodies are um, constrained or not constrained. And of course, um, we are in the South, you know, at this particular site, you know, we're talking about um, a black body in particular who uh, sent out into space and, and died and, you know, I, I surmise a lot of people don't know who he is, even though he, he had this, as you said, um, incredible soundtrack in him. Um, so I wonder how race might function in this particular um, installation and how it connects to where you've touched upon it at other points in, in your work as well. When I came upon the story of Ron McNair, I was so 
happy and I don't know, is it pride? Uh, I don't know if that's the word because, but that it was, you had this sort of like, like a genius in terms of uh, one of the f first uh, astronauts being uh, at ease with traveling in space and yet being such a good musician, having the idea of bringing his instrument with him. I was so proud of somebody of having those qualities, of being a great mathematician, that you have to be to the, ex to the extent that you, you have to have all this expertise and knowledge and, and control of, of the self, I believe, uh, must be very necessary when you are so far away captive uh, in space and yet being able to play an instrument which is so much related to to a sense of freedom, resistance, unreliability. Unreli it's beautiful in that sense. Um, but this is where it this is where somehow it ends. How does it fit in the landscape of, of today? I tried to keep my work a step behind the main discourses. Um, of the society. However, it's not the first time that I have worked with these issues, uh, indirectly uh, or directly. For example, the mention of the film I said, uh, Jamil Mundok, fantastic black saxophone player. It's like when you see him suspended, it's like bigger than life in the way of uh, the, the, the body, the, the suspended body. Uh, uh, trying to forget his condition, that when, when you think of a body trying to forget his condition, of course, one of the first things you think is also the history of of black people. Um, and then another example, which has been much more focused somehow, intuitively, but yet focused on these issues, is the film I, uh, I did called La Cat in Senegal, about three children who are speaking Wolof, uh, a local uh, but very important language in Senegal that over the course of time during the, the French uh, colonization, it, it lost all its terms for primary colors, like red, blue, yellow, green. Well, I think, I think they're all connected in, a, um, in an investigation of, of, of power structures in a certain way, uh, not always in an obvious, um, or not necessarily obvious, but not always in a didactic fashion. Yeah. That reminds me of a quote from you where you say that you're hoping to create moments of doubt where there are too many certainties and moments of certainty when there are too many doubts. Um, and this also gets me to an inherently political question about irony, because I do think that uh, not to harp on, it's not about postmodernism per se, but I think that we as viewers whether we are lay people or art historians or music historians or what have you, we're always looking for that critical element, that ironic element, that uh, self-aware element. And I love in this quote that you're talking about not only creating doubt, but creating certainty. So I'd love to hear you talk more about that and also if you see any certainty here at the Cistern. Well, I think uh, the main, so to say, the main character in the film, in the work that is presented in the system, is the, I keep on saying of the turntable, but actually it's the stylus that is, it's a little bit like the, uh, like a wood picker. So that's the main character, and somehow that's what it does, just in the moments where everything is lost, meaning what are the, the mathematical possibilities that it will fall back in place and play music. So in the middle of all this uh, uncertainty, is able to arrive to land and to, 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 to play the music in a way that it seems like a real beginning most of the time. Although in the real piece of music of, of Messiaen, it's somewhere in between because it's a very legato, it's a very connected uh, way how the music is written. Um, or just in the moment when it looks like finally he, it can play, that's exactly the moment when, when it loses it again, it loses traction again. So in, in that sense, it's, it's just when you have a, the, cert the certainty of a continuity, this is where the rupture is arriving, and when you have the certainty that this is going to be a rupture all the time, that's when music come, comes back. So in, in a way, it's a very cyclic uh, relation, but this is what is happening all the time in time no longer. Um, this uh, um, certainty and, 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 and doubt and continuity and rupture exchanging places all, all, all the time. 
Yeah, I think that exchange is also interesting in terms of your uh, collaborative impulse, but it also makes me want to ask about sincerity. So being in that space, I had a very sort of uh, sincere and, and visceral reaction to the, uh, especially the moments when, uh, when the lights are out and it's hard to see. And I wonder about that, that response in the viewer or, or, or your response to seeing the work, that sort of space of, of a sincere uh, reaction as opposed to, or maybe uh, connected to a, a critical or intellectual one. So maybe it's a question of sincerity, but also of what sorts of response you hope, responses you hope to elicit from the viewer. I would start by saying that at the very beginning, um, there is this, depending on one comes in, but at the beginning of the loop, one sees this space full of columns, like a forest of columns. It's immense, eventually you might not see the end of it. And then soon, all of a sudden, you see something floating in, in mid-air in the middle of the space, which is the, the, thanks to this hollow ghost screen, which is translucent, so you can see through, and only the brighter parts of the image are projected on it, and then the black part you can see through the space. And then there's also this play that I've been doing with uh, Patrick Giringeli, the, the, the light designer of uh, playing with the background, and when you see through more, and when you see through less. So in the beginning you see this projection that sometimes it materializes and sometimes it dematerializes. Um, with the, sometimes with the, uh, with the help of the sound, these moments of materialization become the even more clear. And then people start moving around. Like I said, it's like this screen is floating. It's very long, it's 45 meters long by seven meters. So it almost cuts the space in half, but you don't feel the cutting because you can see through. And then as you go around, you have these other interruptions, which are the, the columns that they, they produce this continuous interruption of the image. Somehow your brain has to stitch it back together to understand what it is, depending on where you choose to stop or continue to take the straw. And then the way how we're playing with the lights when you're still in, the f in this uh, first half of the space, it's playing between being here, being there. Now the whole, um, uh, uh, the idea, the, the, the machine of the, of, this, of the cinema theater, of film theater, is that everything is done for you to be elsewhere. And elsewhere is your home within the time of the film. The columns and the system becomes the, the background of the film. But it's at, at once, it's a, it's a landscape, it's a real place. And on that side, between all the, the because of the projections, all the, the, the play with shadows and lights, plus the additional lights that we have, that we program, it just produces this sort of very anatomical body that is breathing and you don't know whose body it is because it's like you are already within, you, can, you don't have the right distance to understand what you are looking at. So all of a sudden you have this narrative which is mostly all the time two-dimensional, which is the film, with certain bursts of three-dimensionality when the film is dark and the lights go on in the back and you can see the space, so the two-dimensionality of the film becomes space. But then as soon as you go around, it's all about the space and it's all about the anatomy of, of the background of the film, so to say. So what is behind the film? Also in my work, uh, as well in previous exhibitions, I'm very interested in the choreography of the visitor, the pace they choose to go around, how somehow you, you hint at, without obliging, you hint at how you wish at best them to, to, to go around at which pace, where to stop, where to spend longer time, when to move on again. So I wanted to conclude with one last uh, quote of yours. Uh, you're very quotable, which is quite <laughs> an accomplishment. Um, you say, what I call a place is where one remembers having mm. been. I wonder how you will relate to the cistern mm. when you leave Houston, or how you relate to other uh, works that are very dependent on the site. I think site-specific is maybe an overused and not quite correct term here, but um, I wonder how you relate to these spaces when you, when you leave them and if you return to them in any way. Well, I think 
Um, although, for example, this work, when whenever it will be shown in the future in an exhibition or in a totally different uh, context, definitely it won't bring about the same uh, experience, relation. It will be different, not necessarily less or more, just different because it won't be hosted and surrounded by this magnificent place, which is the, the, the system. On the other side, somehow the, the features of the architecture of the system are embedded in the work because, like I said, all the rhythm of the silences in between the moments that it plays are there in a certain duration to make up for what would become the, the reverb in this place. So, in other moments when, when, um, when the film will be shown elsewhere, it's, it's no longer, the, the silences are still the same, they are there, but they are no longer inhabited by the reverb of the system they will be inhabited by the, by, uh, by the reverb mostly of the film itself, of the space station uh, itself, which, is, which we have in the mix of the film. So it will have left its imprint in the, in the way how the, the, the rearrangement of the music is, is constructed uh, in, in the film. Um, but otherwise, I, th I think a place like the system is quite extraordinary because, uh, or and maybe even becomes even more so in moments of uh, after this one year of a pandemic, where we were all, or maybe not all, but many of us, we were. Uh, uh, it was so different. You are there. You are alone, spending time within a space with yourself. So that was a fantastic transition because you are still in a space which is real but extremely mental. It's mm -hmm. as big as it can be, but it's just, you can contain it within a blink of your eye. I think that's a wonderful way to put it and a wonderful way to conclude. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you, Will. It was Such a, a pleasure. pleasure. Yeah.